How many are excited about hearing the word? Amen. God's word is so good and it's so refreshing. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it doesn't return void, but it accomplishes what it's sent forth to accomplish in Jesus' name. I pray that you would just uh, breathe upon everything that's being said today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, this uh, we're finally at the armor of God. As you know, a couple months ago, we started this series uh, in Ephesians, and we talked about, first of all, in Ephesians, it talks about where we sit, like where we're seated. And we understand reading the first few chapters of Ephesians that we're seated in a place of authority. Say a place of authority. So we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and every name that is named. And he has given us a place of authority in him. And now that we've gotten to the end of Ephesians, we realize that we get to wear God's armor. And I think that's pretty cool that, you know, we can actually fit into the armor of God because we're co-heirs with him which tells us one thing, that we're called to battle. We're called to be a battling ram in the kingdom of God. See, we're not, we we don't just go through life just accepting everything that comes down the old swamp tube, okay? And I know, and that's why I have such an issue with some of the extreme Calvinistic teaching and stuff is because it's kind of like, well, you know, we don't have free will and, you know, we can't do this and ultimately God's will will happen. And you get into that, what happens is it strips you of your armor and the devil can come in and attack you and hit you. Because you don't realize that you're called to be a battle ram. You're called to be an, a soldier in the army of God. Amen? And so uh, as we get into this this morning, we're going to go right to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And it says here, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We're talking about that word power. It actually... It actually speaks of dominion. It's talking about manifested power. It's talking about reigning authority. The actual word means reigning authority. So we reign with Christ. So we have an authority that's been given so that we can pursue the thing that God has called us to do. Amen? Hi, Cara. It's so nice to see you. Where's your hubby? He's still working. Okay. Awesome. I haven't seen you for a while. Merry Christmas. Everyone say, hi, Cara. Okay, there we go. Now that I've embarrassed her, she'll beat me up later. Um, But God is good. He wants us to have reigning authority. He wants us to know who we are in him, that we can actually do battle. We 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 can actually move back and push back the forces of darkness that come against our lives. Because he has called us, and he has put his armor upon us. I mean, that's an awesome thing. And if we could get that in our spirit, we'd do so much for God. Amen? I talked last week about um, how we have to stand against the wiles of the devil. We have to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wile actually means to, um, to travel over. And if you were here last week, I spoke about, you know, the fact that when I was taking martial arts, I had to learn to stand and, and, and balance myself so that I could fight. If you can't stand, you can't balance yourself, how many know you're going down, right? And, and so we need to stand and be aware of the enemy's devices, How does the enemy want to attack me? We need to be aware of that. I talked last week about how I was in in Cuba and I was distracted by my wife's beauty. And all of a sudden, uh, she looked at me and her eyes went big. And I was like, why is she looking like that? And a wave came behind me and just took me off my feet. And I, I was tumbling under the water, right? And because I was distracted. So how many know we can get distracted? And if you get distracted, that's when you get attacked, right? That's when you're like, wow, what happened, right? And so God wants us to stand. He wants us to be sober. He wants us to be alert, not in fear, but be alert because the enemy has a lot of patience. He's been around for 6,000 plus years, you know, in the spirit realm. And he'll wait a few years to get you. You got to be sober and alert. Amen. Know your weaknesses and learn to stand. Okay. You know, Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, it says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay? And so we need to understand that first first of all. When you're having an argument with somebody else or you're having a bad relationship with somebody else, you're not wrestling against them. You're wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts in wickedness in the heavenly realms. Right? So... People are influenced by one of two sources, God's kingdom or the devil's kingdom. And so if the devil's kingdom is influencing them and they're angry with you, you you can get angry at them, but you got to realize that there's a spiritual battle going on here. 
right? It goes a little deeper. And once we recognize that, we can learn to fight effectively in a place called prayer, okay? Now, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, read on here. God wants us to withstand in the evil days and having all to have done all to continue to stand, okay? And I want to talk about that word withstand. That word withstand is actually the word antihistamine. It actually means to vigorously oppose, to bravely resist, standing face to face against an adversary to stand your ground. So we need to boldly, say boldly, resist the attacks of the enemy. And the word antihistamine, this is where we get the word uh, withstand. Do you guys know what histamine is? Because I'll read it to you so we, we figure it out here. Now, going back to the natural sense, okay? Histamine is a chemical found in some of the body cells, okay? Cause uh, many symptoms of allergies, such as a running nose, sneezing. And when a person is allergic to a particular substance, such as a food or dust, the immune system mistakenly believes that this unusual or this usual harmless substance is actually harmful to the body. In an attempt to protect the body, the immune system starts a chain reaction that prompts some, some of the body cells to release this chemical called histamine to attack a substance that's coming against us, okay? And uh, the histamine then acts on a person's eyes, on their nose, their throat, their lungs, their skins, their gastrointestinal tract, and they cause allergic reactions. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you deal with allergies, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, you, you, you guys have probably heard of antihistamine, right? And so you take an antihistamine, you take a pill when histamine starts to rise up, right? You take a pill. And, and, and in the same way, I want to say this, is that, that we have a spiritual histamine that tries to come up from within. And, and, and it, it, see, the battle is not always from without. Sometimes the battle is coming from within. And it's like, you know, sometimes somebody's coming against us or they say something or there's a situation that's going on. And, and our spiritual man, we, we respond as if it's an attack against us when it really isn't. And these emotions start to come up. And we begin to feel like, well, you know, I'm angry at this person. I can't believe they said that to me. And just like in the natural, it begins to affect your eyes. Have you ever had a situation where... You're really ticked and you start rolling your eyes. Oh, oh. You need to take a pill, man. Take a gospel. Because you're rolling your eyes. Or, you know, we, we, we go out to sometimes with my wife. She has a bit of an allergy uh, to uh, pollen. So we go, ragweed. So wherever there's ragweed, we went out to visit um, somebody out in Frankfurt. And her eyes started to swell up. And she's, you know, she looked really bad. And then I said, honey, I don't think you should drive. You, you know, they might pull us over. And. I said, you look really bad. And she couldn't see clear, and everything gets foggy, and you just can't see clear. And you know, it's like that in the spirit. When you're not reacting properly, when this spiritual histamine's coming up, and, and, and offense, and, you know, anger, and, you know, depression, all these things start coming from within, you can't see clearly anymore. How many know what I'm talking about? You start rolling your eyes, you know? Sometimes the histamine, when it comes up in the natural, right, affects your throat. Same thing in the spiritual. You hear people talk, I can't believe they said this. They're not a good Christian. It affects your throat, right? This histamine affects, there's an allergic reaction that takes place, right? And that's why, um, I'll give you an example. I'm going to have Candy come and give an example of how the enemy works from within. Okay, is Candy here? Candy Lose, okay, I'm just going to tell you a little story, because sometimes we don't even realize. Don't worry, it's not about you, Pierre. Okay, she's like, Whoa. <laughs> That's good. Um, last year, I went down to Georgia to the Bee in Health, and there was a lady there uh, in the campground, and she was friendly enough, but she wasn't, like, overly friendly. But uh, I was in the campground, and and she knew I was there without a car, so she offered to give me rides to and from um, uh, the course we were going to every, every day. So um, one day, we were coming home, and, um, and we both had established that we weren't doing anything that night, and we were kind of 
thinking that we might be able to get together kind of thing, right? And, and because it's, she's new and we're kind of establishing a relationship, is, you, know, you know how when you're feeling somebody out, right? Anyway, so she pulls into her driveway, runs out of the car, just gets out and runs in the house. And I'm like, wow, what did I say? Like, was it something I said? I, I, and I kept thinking about what did I say? And I was going over our conversations. I'm like, uh, maybe, you know, she doesn't like me. She, she, does, she didn't even give me the time of day. She didn't say goodbye. She didn't say, why don't we get together? She didn't say nothing. She just left. And I started thinking all kinds of things. Like, all kinds of things started coming at me. Like, is it my fault? Is it her? Like, I, I was so confused. Anyway, so later that night, I was walking through the campground, and she catches up with me, and she goes, I'm so sorry I took off on you like that. I really had to go pee. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, my gosh. I just fretted over that for hours, and she just had to pee, you know. Anyway, so it's just amazing how, like, the enemy could just totally get into your head and getting just throw everything at you anyway. Good story. And many of you could get up here and grab the mic and give me a similar story, right? Because sometimes we, we perceive, and then, then sometimes if we're really spiritual, we, we, we think it's the Holy Spirit telling us something about somebody when really it's just, it's our, it's our you know, reaction, a negative reaction. The enemy's putting emotions and thoughts in us. And we're allowing these things to come up, and it's, it's robbing us of the peace that God wants us to have. Amen? So when we talk about spiritual armor, sometimes it's an attack that's coming from, you know, from this way, but many times it's from within. And that's what I wanted to just, um, you know, talk about. And like I, some of you heard this story. I was working as a machinist in, in, up, up north, and I had a, a boss who just criticized me all the time and was always picking on me. And he'd walk in the room, and I would get nervous uh, because I felt like, oh, what's he going to say now? What am I doing wrong? And I lived under that just assuming he really didn't like me and how many knows I should have really sat down and had a talk with him but finally I did I decided I'm gonna go tell him I'm quitting and it's not working so I go into his office I say, listen I know you don't like my work I'm gonna give you my two weeks notice I'm out of here and he shut the door and he said no no you're my best worker he goes I'll give you a raise don't leave and I'm like hold on a second okay uh, I've been going on six months thinking you hate me no I really like you I'm just a jerk okay fine <laughs> But you see, this, an, this, this, this histamine starts coming. I'm, I'm giving you an analogy. There's no spiritual histamine. I'm just giving you an analogy that there's just this thing that's coming up from within and, and, and causing us to live out of a place of peace, right? Um, Romans chapter 7, verse 14 to 20. I'm reading it of the New Living. Paul says, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. This trouble is with me, for I am all too human a slave to sin. All right. Uh, I don't really understand myself for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree with the law, that the law of God is good. So I am not the one who's doing the wrong. It's this histamine that's coming out of me. It's this sin living in me. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. All right. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Okay. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living within me that does it. All right. And so we see here this that Paul is dealing with this this issue, this issue that's going on within him. And how did this make Paul feel as the apostle? We go down to Romans chapter seven, verse twenty-four. Oh, what a miserable person I am! How many have felt that way? You know. You're trying to be spiritual and you mess up. Oh, what a miserable person I am. I shouldn't. I'm so stupid. I mean, I've done. I don't know if you have. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And so this is what we're talking about, this battle that tries to rise up from within us. And um, we'll go to the good news, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. So now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. And because you belong to him, the power of life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his only son in the body of, like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared to an end sin's control over us by giving his son 
as a sacrifice for us. So I want to say this. Here's the good news. This spiritual histamine, this sin nature has no power over you. Don't give it it. Don't give the enemy any power, right? You have to stand against it. Don't let it rise up within you, but suppress it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? And so we need to recognize that sometimes feelings and thoughts will try to rise up in our life, and, and, and these attacks are coming from within, and that's what the whole armor of God is talking about, how to, how to fight against this war from within. So we're going to talk about that this morning. So we're going to look at the, uh, the, uh, the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. And it says this. I'm just waiting for the verse. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the, bre- the breastplate of righteousness. Okay? Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. You want to talk about the belt of truth? What does a belt do? A belt encircles you. It's so important that we encircle ourselves with the truth. It's so easy today we can get online and we can watch all kinds of documentaries, all kinds of, of, of uh, different theologies and ways of thinking, and, uh, and we look at all that stuff. And we have to be careful because whatever you surround yourself with is what will empower you. Amen? If you're going to surround yourself with the truth of God's word, it, it, it is going to be like a protection around you. It's going to tell you one of, one of the things the belt of truth did in Roman armor was it would surround you and it had a strap, a leather strap or sometimes metal straps that hung down to pr- protect your genitals, okay? This is important. Why? Because that word loins actually speaks of procreative power. Whatever truth you surround yourself with is what you're going to procreate. That is what you're going to create. So, you know, if, you, if you're a Holy Spirit, Word of God Christian, and you surround yourself with the truth of God's Word, guess what you're going to procreate in your natural children? You're going to procreate, you're going to procreate the God, Word of God into their life. And even spiritual children, whatever you are is what you will duplicate. So surround yourself with the truth of God's Word. Okay. Now, in the Old Testament, we understand also that um, the term to gird up. How many know in biblical days they, they wore these? How many seen the movies, right? They wear these long, these long gowns, right? They wore these long robes, and they would, they would go around. They didn't wear pants like we do today. They wore these long robes. But when they had to get busy at work or they had to go to battle, they would gird up their loins, Now, I have a picture. Did you bring that picture in? We'll bring the picture up. This is what it means to gird up your loins. So you would reach down. You would grab your dress. You'd wrap it through your legs, bring it around, and you would tuck it in. So you you were ready for battle. Because how many know if you try try to go to battle or you try to do work and you're moving quickly, you're going to trip on the loose ends. And so it was important to gird up their garments so that they were able to um, go to battle. And uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5 says, Righteousness shall be a belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. This is the truth, the belt of truth. It's faithfulness. God will be faithful to his word. If you trust his word, if you read it and you say, Lord, I believe your word is for me. I trust you. You're a faithful God. You're surrounding yourself with the truth. And if you believe he's faithful, you're going to procreate a generation that believes in the faithfulness of their God. Isn't that good? Here's another verse, 1 Peter chapter 1, 13. You'll probably see it differently now. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. To gird up the loins of your mind means to deal with the loose ends that exist in your minds and your emotions. Don't just go through life thinking, you know, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'm reading my Bible. But you're letting thoughts come that are negative all the time. Take those thoughts, wrap them around and put them under the submission to the truth. I'm going to say this is so important because if you don't deal with the loose ends of thinking, if you don't, it's going to rob you from the peace and joy that God wants you to have. 
Amen? Correct those parts of our thinking that we know are wrong. Say, no, I'm going to take every thought captive because it's not because God wants to control me, but because God wants me to live in freedom. I'm not going to think this way anymore. I'm going to stop thinking that I'm no good for nothing. I'm going to stop thinking that, you know what, I'm never going to excel. In I'm going to no longer think I, I, I'm nervous and I can't share my faith. Say, no, I'm no longer going to do that. Take those loose ends of thinking and tuck it into the truth and hold it in subjection. Remove them by the authority of God's word. I want to say this. When we, ch we choose to permit things to exist in our lives that hinder our steps and slow us down in our race and our ability to successfully fight in God's armor, army, we got to deal with these things. If we're going to be fighting in God's army, we have to cut off the loose ends of our thinking. Amen? So, the, so we got this here, the belt of truth, which is hidden under the shield. The next one is... We need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Amen? The righteousness is, is what protects the heart. It protects the vital organs. Anything here is being protected, your lungs, your heart, right? It's all being protected by the, the breastplate of righteousness. And so that word righteousness actually means the quality of being right. How many know you can be right? Okay, Truth isn't re relevant. It's actually you can, there is truth. And there's error. And you can be right. The Bible says we're to walk righteously, all right, in conformity to the will of God. So important. And, and I want to explain this because when we get born again, we become positionally righteous. We're seated with Christ, and we inherit his righteousness. But then there is a practical righteousness. Say practical. So God wants us to practically walk out what is right in our lives? Not to be hearers of the word, right? Not just to be hearers, but to be doers of the word of God. God wants us to walk out what we know is right in our hearts. So practically walking out the truth. If we allow the truth to gird up our loins, it becomes practical righteousness. And it will protect our hearts. Amen? That's why the Bible says, guard your hearts, for out of it flows the issues of life. How do you guard your heart? You put on the belt of truth. And if you have the belt of truth on, it produces righteousness in your life, and it protects you. Everything begins with the truth. Everything ends with the truth. Amen? And I believe Paul was just sitting there in prison in Rome, and he was sitting there probably staring at his guard that was standing there while he was writing and saying, how can I get these Christians to understand? And he began to write out the armor of God and what it symbolized. Amen? And so... The next one is the shoes of the gospel of peace, which is on, on the soldier's feet. And I love this verse here in Isaiah 52, verse 7. It says this, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news, the good news of peace and salvation, the news that the God of Israel reigns. You know, the gospel is good news. I mean, we got to stop, as Christians, we got to stop walking around like we just drank lemon juice, you know, like, well, you know, I don't know what they're going to think if I share the gospel and they're going to think I'm really, no, just tell them the good news, that God's not holding their sin against them. They just need to repent, give their heart to Christ, that he loved them so much that he sent his son to die for them. And listen, you can have newness of life. You can cut off all the loose ends that you've been struggling with all your life. And God wants you to know that you're loved. I mean, this is a good gospel. Amen. It's good news. It's more than just being saved from hell. That's important. But it's coming into relationship with God. It's about being adopted. This is good news. And, you know, I think, I think of the song, joy, for, joy to the World, right? Joy to the world, the Lord has come, right? That's what it's about. Joy. The kingdom is full of joy. And then the last one here is above all, not the last one, but the next one, is take up the shield of faith. So, so we are to take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This is important because God is not going to do it for you. It doesn't say that God is going to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. No, he says you will quench. It's our responsibility. And Jesus looked at many of the people he healed and he said to them, he said, go, your faith has healed you. Amen. Say, it all begins with truth. 
If you surround yourself with truth, it produces a breastplate of righteousness. If you trust in the truth and you believe in the truth and you believe in Christ as you're right, and all of a sudden you have a shield of faith that you are able to quench all, not some, but all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And you know, it was funny because I was talking to Marilyn, which we miss and she'll be back soon. And she was saying, you know, it really struck me. I was really reading this and I thought, how does a shield, a metal shield or a wooden shield, quench fiery darts? I could see it stopping them, but how does it quench it? She goes, unless that shield is made of water. Amen? We talk about the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is like water, refreshing, right? And so God will not only stop the fiery darts, he'll put them out as we hold up our shields of faith. So we need to begin to read the word and we have to believe the word and say, God, I believe this is for me and I'm going to hold up the shield of faith to stop the attacks of the enemy. You don't have to say every attack can be stopped by my faith, not God's faith, my faith in his truth. So that's why we have to surround ourselves, encircle ourselves with his truth, have the word of God constantly coming in so that we can begin to trust in his word and he'll come. How many know we're agents of free will? I don't care what John Calvin said. We're agents of free will. I'm going to pick on that for a while. Praise God. So God will be with us and will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 17, I love this. God is speaking to Moses and he says, you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. God has given us a shield in which we can quench, but it's up to us. We have to choose. Am I going to believe you, God, with an aggressive faith for the things that you promised me in your word? And when you do, it's well-pleasing to him. Isn't that good? You know, and sometimes God, because God's sovereign, say God's sovereign, he'll come and just do what he wants to do. But we have to realize that we have a part to play. We have to quench the fiery darts with the faith that we have, okay? So here we'll go to the next one. The helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation actually protects our minds, again, from the attacks of the enemy. The battle is always in the mind or begins in the mind. And then the next one is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive piece of weapon that we have, okay? You're not going to be attacking with your helmet, going, ah, you know, chasing the, the enemy down with your helmet or with your belt, you know, whipping, whipping the enemy. I mean, you're not going to do that because then your pants will fall off. You're not going to do that. But you're going to use your sword. And that is the sword of the Spirit, which is what? It's the Word of God. And so we have to learn to take the promises of God and use it as a battle axe. When the enemy comes to attack, when the enemy came to attack Jesus, the son of the living God, and he said, you know, you need to eat some bread, right? What did Jesus say? He stood up with the word and he attacked back and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds of the mouth of God. And then the enemy came back and attacked again, and, and he used scripture to attack Jesus, and he used it out of context. And then Jesus attacked back with what? With the written word. So do you see how everything surrounds it? It's all about surrounding yourself with the belt of truth. It all starts there. You can't have a shield of faith. You can't have a sword of the spirit. You can't have your mind protected with the helmet. You can't have the right gospel on your feet if you don't have the belt of truth. The belt of truth is the first thing. If we focus on that, everything else will come into play. Amen? Does that make sense to everybody? Um. I want to finish with a prophetic word that was spoken by our Heavenly Father over 6,000 years ago in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman. God is cursing the serpent, he says here. Between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. His heel. The woman... He said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and, and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Next verse. Was that it? Okay. I wasn't going for verse 16, but the point is here. There's an attack. 
There's a battle that's going on. But Jesus wins. Jesus has already won 2,000 years ago. We're just standing ground and not allowing the enemy back. He can't take, he can't take ground. We've got to stand against him. Amen? And I want to read this uh, just uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Look what she says. Let it be to me according to your word. You see, see how she's using the sword of the Spirit? And the angel departed from her. She said, your word, God. You declared it. I believe it. And because she believed it, she declared the word of God. It has creative power to bring God's purpose into the world. When you declare God's word, it releases God's purpose into your life. When you declare God's word over your life and over your kids, it, it, it releases purpose into your life. And I think when I was a backslidden mess back years and years ago, my parents would still declare He's a man of God. He's going to serve God. He's going to, they didn't go, oh, that poor sinner. No, they talked. They spoke the word of God. They spoke the word of God. And God was able to use that as a creative power to bring, procreate or bring me back in to God's purposes. Amen? And some of you need to hear that today. You need to begin to speak God's word over your kids. Begin to declare the creative truth of what God's word says, and it will be a weapon against what the enemy is trying to yield against you. Amen? Amen. And in closing, I want to read this verse, and I'm going to have the worship team come. We're going to do a couple songs. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15 to 18. I'm just going to read it out of the Message Bible because it sums it up. Be prepared. You're not against, sorry, you're up against far more than you, you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over, but the shouting, you can still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than just words. Learn how to apply them in your life. Okay? You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or that nobody drops out. Again, last week I talked about the importance of relationship. Why do we fight? We fight against the enemy to protect our relationships. First and foremost, to protect our relationship with God. And secondly, to protect our relationships one with another. That's why Paul says at the end of this whole thing, keep praying with prayer and supplication for all the saints because God loves us all and he wants us all to come together at the banquet supper of the Lamb. Amen? Why don't we stand together? Father, I thank you for every person in this place. Holy Spirit, you have given us all this suit of armor that is your armor, God, and you've allowed us to crawl into it and to fight the good fight of faith. And I thank you, Lord, that we just stand ground. We don't allow the enemy. And help us to recognize maybe some areas in our lives that are like that spiritual histamine, that that keeps rising to the surface. Candy gave such a good illustration, God, that we would deal with that tonight. And actually, I'm going to make um, an altar call for that. Some of you really struggle with maybe depression or anxiety, these emotions that are really negative that seem to come up when you feel like you're being attacked, even if you're not. And, and God wants to set you free today. And I'm going to ask Pastor Jacques and Neil and Mark and Camilla, if you guys want to come up and we're going to have an altar call today. You, want to just, you just want prayer for breakthrough. Say, I, I'm not going into 2018 with all of this mess coming up. I want to be set free from that today. How many know it's not by strength, it's not by might, but it's by my power, says the Lord. It's by my spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. And we're, just, and we're going to worship. You're going to lead us into some worship. For those of you who want ministry, I want you to come up during the worship time. We're going to pray with you for breakthrough. Maybe there's someone in this place, you don't know the Lord Jesus. You don't have a relationship. You've known or heard of religion, but you don't have a relationship with Christ. I want you to come forward as well, and we'll pray with you. God wants to embrace you today in Jesus' name. Amen.